Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. I am Johnny Talk Sports here to bring you a jam packed video this evening. We're going to start off with the Week 7 College Football recap with some hot topics, major storylines, all of that. So let's get started. Let's kind of start off with kind of the obvious Alabama dominated Tennessee. Alabama just truly just expresses why they're the number one team in the country. But will that last that long? Stay tuned for the end of the video. They basically trounced Tennessee 4 to 10 who we, which we kind of expected Tennessee was going to be down this game no matter what. Because they had so many injuries on the defense side of the football. Jalen Hurd just basically exploited that. With three rushing touchdowns, pretty much just propelled himself into the Heisman conversation. However, if you notice in that game, Alabama kind of started so in the first quarter. It took them a little while to score, but they finally scored toward the end of the first quarter, maybe about six minutes left. Because Alabama's kind of, they start off slow, but, and you need to take advantage of that when you play Alabama. Like, if you don't start off quick, you're eventually going to find yourself being down like 21-0 or 38-0, stuff like that. That's what Ole Miss did in week three. They took advantage early. They knew Alabama was going to play slow because they saw that the last two weeks. So they jumped to a 24-3 lead at some point in the game. However, they just couldn't hang on to that. They just settled back, and they let Alabama just win. All right. Let's kind of start with what was the probably the most shocking thing of the weekend? North Carolina State almost beating Clemson. They basically had him on the ropes. Just think about it. Just think the ropes about, you have about a 10-foot rope. It's just kind of all the way out here. They had Clemson at around this part of the rope. They literally had it right toward the end of the rope. However, kicker missed the field goal to, sit, to win the game for him. Kind of a chip shot. However, you can't really blame him that pressure situation. He had to kick it right in front of the right in front of the crazy Clemson fans. And plus Dabo iced him. However, he did miss a field goal earlier in the game at, toward the beginning. And plus North Carolina State was plagued by penalties early on in the first and second quarter. So they they basically left about a total of twelve to fourteen points up on that scoreboard. And plus, they couldn't take advantage of all of the four Clemson turnovers. I mean, if you play a, Cle a Clemson team led by Deshaun Watson, you have four turnovers, you better take advantage of at least three of those turnovers. Because if you only take advantage of one of them, you're probably not going to necessarily win the game. You're not guaranteed that. And that's the mistake that North Carolina State basically did. However, Clemson managed to pull it off in overtime with a big interception to remain undefeated. Now Miami, Florida, and Virginia Tech staying in the ACC, they had heartbreaking losses. Virginia upset by Syracuse by 14, who many thought were going to win by like 20 or 23, according to the Syracuse head coach. And Miami just couldn't make a comeback. They were found themselves down 23 at the half, but Brad Kaya just missed their missed receivers, the receivers are dropping passes. It was just a disaster for Miami. However, they kind of had a little spark. Manny Diaz led the defense. He called the right plays on defense, but Brad Kai just couldn't take advantage. So now, Miami with a two loss team pretty much eliminated out of playoffs. They fell out of the top 25. Virginia Tech also fell out of the top 25. So right now, the only team in the ACC that really has a, has a logical shot it's probably Clemson. Because I honestly think Louisville, for them to get to the playoff, they would need Washington to lose. They would need Ohio State and Michigan to lose. They would need Alabama to lose. They would need Texas A&M to lose. I honestly do not think a one-loss Alabama team does not get in over a one-loss Louisville team. No matter what, I think Alabama could lose to LSU on November the 5th by three points and still get in that fourth spot over a one-loss Louisville team. Because Alabama playing in the SEC, the toughest conference, and Louisville in the ACC conference, which is kind of getting up there toward the rise a little bit. I would say I'd say the ACC is probably the fourth strongest out of the Power Fives. In fact, here's my preference. SEC toughest, Big Ten the second toughest, 
Big 12 the third toughest. ACC fourth toughest. And the weakest out of the group of five, the Pac-12. As you have noticed that, Oregon stinks this year. Washington, out of all teams, are the only is the only team that has a real shot of making the playoffs in the Pac-12. So, for the Pac-12 to get a spot in the playoffs, it's all in the Washington egg basket right now. Let's also recap this crazy game. Ohio State versus Wisconsin. Now, I told you this game was going to be a hard-fought game. It was going to be one in the trenches. And it basically was. It took overtime to get it done, but Ohio State figured it out. JT Barrett found an open receiver in the in the end zone. And the Ohio State defense had a fantastic goal line stand, theoretically goal line stand. However, they were managed to stop Alex Hornibrook in the part in their part of the overtime. So the Ohio State defense basically prevailed the overall team. So I think that's all I have for you guys. I did Alabama and Tennessee. I did the Ohio State mission, Ohio State Wisconsin. I did the Clemson, North Carolina State, the Miami, the Virginia Techs. Oh yeah, Florida State kind of—they were a 22-point favorite against Wake Forest, only won 17 to six. However, Travis Rudolph had a dominating performance. Could he take the new Kelvin Benjamin role in this Florida State offense? And plus, do not count out the Seminoles yet. They could still beat Clemson, and they could find themselves right back into the playoff conversation. Although I think the theoretical possibility of Florida State making the playoffs is probably less than a percent and a half. Just because I don't think that the committee will take a two-loss Florida State team over maybe a one-loss Houston team or a one-loss Louisville team. I just don't see that happening. Now I think that's all I have for you. Oh, yes. Last thing I promise. Stanford beat Notre Dame. Stanford did not have Christian McCaffrey. And Deshaun Kaiser just couldn't make the clutch play to force overtime. It was a low-scoring game, kind of like what I kind of expressed, that it'd be kind of low-scoring, both teams going to struggle. It was basically just for both teams to just find their identity again. However, I think Stanford's going to probably get it going, as we're going to see in the prediction part of the, in the, part of the podcast, kind of like. However, that's over with. On to the second part of the podcast, the playoff picture. Now, if this thing were to end today, however, since it's not, see, we don't need a committee, because basically, this stuff is already just played out right on this board right here. So let's just face it. Out of all these teams, they're still undefeated. Many of these teams, I can see at least four teams staying undefeated. Because basically the one seed would be the undefeated SEC team, whether it's Alabama or Texas. We basically, whatever happens within this game, whoever wins this one will probably run the table, most likely. If it's Alabama, their biggest test is probably going to be either Auburn or LSU, but I think they'll get it done in the end. If it's Texas and their biggest test left will probably be Ole Miss. And then the second seed would be the undefeated Big Ten team, whether it's Ohio State, Michigan, or Nebraska. Because honestly, I think at least one of these three teams are going to win out. The number three, the undefe- undefeated Clemson, question mark. Number four, undefeated Washington, question mark. But let me just show you that again. And with the need to help. I put Florida with a question mark because I don't know if the committee, if Florida were to win out and they won the SEC title, I do not know if the committee would still accept Florida. After that, basically kind of a, they blew the lead against Tennessee. I, based on the way Tennessee has been playing the last two weeks, I do not know if the committee would be able to accept a one-loss Florida team. Louisville, Houston, among teams that need help. The three Big 12 teams that theoretically have a shot still, Baylor, Western, and Oklahoma. Now, the problem with that is if a Big 12 team loses one game, I think if you want to make the playoff in the Big 12, you got to be 12-0 because there's no conference title in the Big 12. That's why there's always a, there's all, that's why there's a scramble for Houston to join the Big 12, a scramble for Navy to join the Big 12, a scramble for Boise State, BYU to join the Big 12. And we'll see Baylor and West Virginia play each other. We'll see West Virginia and Oklahoma play each other. We'll see Baylor and Oklahoma play each other. 
We'll see those three teams in a round robin eventually. And Florida State still has a chance, and so does Boise State to represent the group of five. However, Boise State, it's a must win this week for Boise State against BYU. It was a pretty talented team. They have the talented athletes, but they just weren't utilized correctly. They weren't utilized against Utah. Well, they kind of were, but they kind of went for two instead of trying to play for overtime. And I think Oklahoma still has a chance to make the playoff because they're starting to hit their stride. Their stride kind of started at T- after TCU. The winning against TCU still gave them confidence. For Oklahoma to make the playoff, they need to beat Baylor. They need to beat West Virginia. Convincingly in both those ones, obviously. But they would also need Washington to lose. They would need Clemson to lose. They would need either both of Louisville or Houston to lose one more. However, Louisville or Houston, both of them, one of them is guaranteed to lose one more as they will play each other in November. But look who's also going to play in November. Ohio State and Michigan. And it could possibly be a one versus 2 matchup. Clemson will also be playing Florida State in a couple of weeks. Washington has a tough game, has some tough games left against Washington State at the end of the year. But they have a tough one against U- at Utah in a couple weeks. Tough one against California, tough one against USC. So do not count Washington in yet. Don't put Washington as a lock. Because they still have some tough games left and the Pac-12 championship game. I'm telling you, if you're a loyal subscriber, the loyal subscriber, and you've been following me since the beginning, I said last that I love college football when it gets closer, for the middle of October toward November, because that's when anything goes. No team is safe. It's either win or just fall short of a championship. Championships are not won in November or October or September or even December. The only way that the only thing that is about national championships associated with this is they can only be lost in October, November, September, or December. They can't be won in those months, but they can certainly be lost. And plus, don't forget, Florida and Florida State play each other at the end of the year. And that Keith in Florida rivalry. And on to the final segment of this podcast. Anyway, comment below, by the way, if you consider this a podcast, based on how long it is. Anyway, week eight cultural predictions. I finally invested in a notebook. I just found one in my house. Kind of random. But Miami, Florida versus Virginia Tech. As I said, both these teams coming off heartbreaking losses against conference foes. This is a Thursday night game in Lane Stadium. I can see Virginia Tech getting the win in this one, but I just think the leadership of Brad Kai is going to pay off eventually. And I think it's going to be a good start here. I just think Brad Kai is going to make the clutch throws at the end of the game. So I'm going to pick Miami to win this one. Look for Brad Kai's leadership to evolve in this game. Another Thursday night game, BYU versus Boise State, kind of who we talked about earlier, who still has a chance to make the playoff to represent the group of five well in a New Year's Six. I think Boise State's going to trail in this game eventually. In the end, though, I just think the BYU running game is going to be too tough for Boise State to stop I like BYU to pull off this upset. Just think about it. Taysom Hill can run the football as well, as well as the running and led by Jamal Williams. Those two can run the football. And plus, BYU has talented wideouts. I just think the offensive talent on BYU is going to be too much for Boise State to handle. It's like Boise State to suffer their first loss of the year. A Friday night one, Oregon versus California. Oregon really needing to find their identity. And California looking to pretty much take the Pac-12 by storm. As nobody really expected much from them after Jared Goff declared for the NFL, but Davis Webb is not doing too bad. I mean, he led California to an upset over Utah, and he could actually win out for Cal, maybe get him to a decent bowl game. And I like Cal doing this one. I just think Oregon just is struggling to find their identity. This will be five losses in a row for Oregon if Cal were to win this game. Which this is kind of unprecedented for, especially Oregon, who was always known for their high-powered offense and their domination of the Pac-12 throughout the last couple of years. That's kind of being taken. That was kind of taken over by Stanford, and this year it could be taken over by somebody like Washington, with a talented quarterback like Jake Browning at Washington. That could be overtaken. All right, a huge match from the Big Ten. Number ten, Wisconsin, trying to come off a heartbreaking loss against Ohio State in overtime against Iowa. I think Iowa's going to really compete in this game from start to finish. 
However, I just think the running game for Wisconsin is going to be a little too tough for Iowa to stop. I like Wisconsin. Pick up a close victory. I'm going to say 21-17. to 17. I like it to be kind of a low-scoring game, battle in the trenches, but I like Wisconsin win the end. Match, a big match from the Big 12. Texas versus Kansas State, kind of the bottom feeders of the conference. I mean, Kansas State is trying to come off with a humiliating loss against Oklahoma, and Texas is trying to make it two in a row after beating Iowa State. I'm picking Texas this one because I just think that the offense for Texas, especially that running game, I think it's going to be too much for Kansas State's defense to stop. I just think if Texas can just keep pounding that football, I think Kansas State's going to have a long day on defense. So I'm going to pick Texas to win this one. I like them to pick up a 44, about 44, 45 to about maybe 28 victory. I just think Kansas State's probably going to hit their down stride. And this is kind of the start of it. Colorado versus Stanford. It's kind of an intriguing matchup because Colorado, nobody really expected that much out of Colorado. They competed with Michigan really well, though, in Week 3 in the big house, but Michigan ended up coming back to win that one. Colorado made it into the rankings. However, they did lose to USC a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to pick Stanford in this one. I don't know if Chris McCaffrey's going to play, though. It hasn't really been decided. But I think the defense for Stanford, that's going to be the difference in this one. This is basically the saving grace point of the season for Stanford. This is where their season is going to start getting saved a little bit. So I like Stanford to win this one. And just really huge match with the Big 12. TCU versus number 12 West Virginia. As I said earlier in the podcast, that West Virginia is one of those teams that could still make the playoff, but they would have to go undefeated. I think TCU being led by Kenny Hill is going to stay in this game from start to finish. However, I just think Tyler Howard is just too strong of a quarterback. Probably one of the most underrated quarterbacks in all of college football. If you want my top three of underrated college football quarterbacks this year, I would say at number one, Jake Browning for Washington. Two, Skyler Howard for West Virginia. And I would say three for an underrated quarterback. I would honestly say either Davis Webb or I would honestly say Taysom Hill. Because those guys are really talented. They could make an NFL team happy next year. But we will see what happens. However, I think Western is going to win this game. I just think there's too much power on the Western Union offense for TCU to stop. So I like Western to pick up a three-point victory. It's going to be really close. Huge match from the Pac-12. Really intriguing if you look at it. Number 19, Utah, going on the road against UCLA. UCLA desperately needs a win. Kind of like Oregon, they need a win for the Pac-12. Or at least on the Pac-12 side of the football. I think we're going to get it done. I think the running game for UCLA is going to play a huge difference in this one. As Utah kind of struggles a little bit on defense, especially stopping the foot, stopping the run. So I like UCLA to kind of exploit that. And if Josh Rosen plays, yeah, if Josh Rosen plays, it's going to be a huge advantage for UCLA. I think Houston's going to get it done anyway, whether he plays or not. So I think the defense is going to make some stops, led by Eddie Vanderdose. So I'm going to pick Houston to pull off this upset against Utah, ending the Utes' chances of a playoff bid. Four matchups left. We've got three in the SEC and one in the Big 12. Our number 17, Arkansas, versus 21, Auburn. Kind of like last week, I think the running game for Arkansas is going to be a huge difference. Because I think Auburn's going to have a hard time. As Auburn had a hard time stopping Travion Williams in week three against Texas A&M. So I think Arkansas is going to really... Arkansas is a two-dimensional team on offense. They're usually known for running the football, but they can also pass the football. Austin Allen, another underrated quarterback, especially in the SEC. And he has targets like Drew Morgan and Sprinkle to throw to. So I'm going to pick Arkansas to win this one. I'm going to say it's going to be a 7-point game. I'm going to say I'm going to say 24-17. Kind of a low-scoring game, lower than what we think. All right, number 16, Oklahoma versus Texas Tech. Many think that Patrick Mahomes for Texas Tech is probably the most underappreciated quarterback in all of college football, and I think he is. I know I did say a little bit ago that I said that Jake Browning was the most underrated quarterback. There's a difference between being underrated and underappreciated. Because Patrick Mahomes... 
is statistically one of the best quarterbacks in college football right now. I think he'll put points on the board against Oklahoma. But who's on the other side of that on the token? Baker Mayfield. He's making his return to Lubbock, Texas. And I think Mayfield to Westbrook is going to happen again. They're starting to hit their stride. In fact, Baker Mayfield's... D.D. Westbrook is now his Baker Mayfield security blanket. And he's going to go to that security blanket at least 12 times in this game. So I like Oklahoma to win this one. I'm going to say Oklahoma's going to pick up a 17-20 to 20 point victory in this game. And plus, Samaji P. Ryan's going to run for a little bit. We kind of know all that. Oklahoma's trying to get their stride going. Maybe they can get a chance to get into the top four or at least maybe a New Year Six game. I think they're going to aim for that. All right, number 23 Ole Miss versus number 25 LSU. Now, LSU is surprisingly in the rankings. Now, after what we saw this year, it's kind of not look. It was kind of not looking good for LSU, but they find their way back into the top 25, going up against an Ole Miss team who's probably heartbroken and angry about how close they were against Arkansas, but they couldn't get the job done. I'm going to pick Ole Miss to win this one because I just think though, I just think the receiving core for Ole Miss is going to be a huge difference. This is just a massive height advantage for these Ole Miss receivers. I kind of knew Ole Miss was going to be competing a couple years ago. Back before I even started a YouTube channel, before I even started talking about it. I saw the recruits Ole Miss had a couple years ago. And I thought, Ole Miss is set up to win, like, SEC big SEC games. This could be one of those games. Going into Baton Rouge, going into Death Valley, and beating LSU. Basically just giving them their third loss of the year and kind of a, just another downfall year. Finally, the game of the week, number six, Texas versus number one, Alabama. So basically, what people think is, Alabama's just going to roll over Texas A&M. It's just not even going to be a 59-0 game again. It's not even going to be close. But Texas A&M is already an 18-point underdog, and it's only Sunday night. So that spread can easily go up. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if the spread was like maybe 21 by the end of the week. However, here's what people are not getting. They're not forgetting that Trevor Knight was the quarterback in the Sugar Bowl when Oklahoma defeated Alabama 45-34. to That's what people are not getting. However, you can say Alabama wasn't really motivated in that game. There wasn't much motivation. Lies. Alabama was motivated to win that game because they were angry. And sure, it could be a difference whether they know they have something to play for or not. But that night, it was A.J. McCarron's last game. It was T.J. Yeldon's last game. It was where Derrick Henry was starting to get, was starting to evolve into an elite running back. So that was a game Alabama was trying to win that night. But too bad Trevor Knight kind of spoiled the party for Alabama. And guess what? He's going to do it again this Saturday. Just look, the difference maker is going to be the speed of Christian Kirk and Josh Reynolds. And the strength of Miles Garden to Sean Hall. Jalen Hurts, the freshman quarterback. I like him. I think he's going to get a little bit nervous facing Miles Garrett to Sean Hall. And you got elite corners and linebackers like Justin Evans and Amani Watts. Alabama's got a complete team as well. But this is the most complete Texas A&M team that I think that they've ever had. And I'm saying this even though they had Johnny Menzel in 2012 to beat Alabama. I just think this team is way more complete than it was in 2012. Because now you don't have to worry about anything on defense. You got offensive weapons on like Trevor Knight, Keith Ford at running back, Travion Williams, a good one two punch. Travion Williams, the speed back, Keith Ford, the strength back. Speed of Christian Kirk and Josh Reynolds. And that's just on the offense side of the ball. Defense side of the ball, you got. You got great safety such as Nick Harvey. Really underrated. Just them is one of the hard the hardest hitting safeties in all of the SEC conference, probably even in all of college football. Amani Watts, who forced a bunch of who had a bunch of key turnovers against Tennessee. The interception to ice it up. And the fumble forced on Alvin Kamara. Because it would have been a tie game at that point. It would have been seven seven. Tennessee with momentum in that one. Amani Watts is a momentum destroyer. So, as I was saying, Texas A&M will pull up this up against Alabama, 31-28. Have a good night, everybody. Anyway, 
Like and subscribe to the channel. Share this video with your friends, your family. That's going to do it for this little podcast. Over 25 minutes. Pretty good for a podcast. Hope you enjoyed my Week 7 cultural recap, my playoff picture, and my Week 8 cultural predictions. Now, I'm planning on doing a mock draft sometime this week. I've kind of been working on it. i just got to figure out the order a little bit since we're about six weeks in the NFL season. I will have my Week 7 NFL predictions up Tuesday or Wednesday for sure. And if I have time, I will have my first mock draft of the year. I'm really excited. Have a great day, everybody. Like and subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends, family. Share it all on your social media accounts, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Snapchats if you can, the Tumblers, the whatevers. Have a good day, everybody. See you next time. Peace out!